to another episode of Trans Regret Snoopy Presents the Bible. I have with me today the head of podcasts at Fanbyte, Merritt Kay, who I'm so excited to speak with about one of the strangest chapters in the strangest book of the Bible, the Song of Solomon, Chapter 7. Welcome, Merritt. Thanks for having me. And yeah, wow, this thing just goes off, huh? The, the first line of this is just... A guy talking about feet. <laughs> he goes he goes straight for the feet. He goes right to the feet. Like, it's like, I guess he's going up. I guess that is how it goes. He goes from the bottom up. But, like, you'd think when you're describing someone, you start at the top and go down. But no, this guy, he knows, he knows what he's about. <laughs> uh, before we go real deep into the text, and there's a lot to chew on. Uh, that was probably a bad pun, but there's a lot to work with here. There's a lot to um, lick, yeah. There's a lot to lick. There's a lot to, to gaze at. Um, but uh, before we do that, why don't you tell folks a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I am, I don't know, I'm, I'm a writer, uh, a podcaster. I've sort of like bounced around doing different things for like the last, I don't know, decade or so since I dropped out of grad school. Um, I, in terms of like my upbringing, I actually grew up in like a pretty agnostic household. So my dad's side of my family is Catholic and my mother's side of my family is Anglican, but like non-practicing at all. And even on my dad's side, the Catholics, like the most they did is like, you know, go to mass on Christmas and um, I, I joke about my family being the worst Catholics in the world because there there things will happen. Like um, I remember one time on Easter, um, my uncle, you know, would would say grace, and um, he was like, "Okay, well, let's all remember the reason why we're here, which is to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ." And uh, you know, I was like, "I don't." Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert. I don't think that's it. I mean, you're probably right. It probably was closer to April than December. But like traditionally Christians, uh, Easter is the, the death and rebirth, not not the. And he wasn't being like, no, the rebirth. He he, he got it confused. So, uh, yeah, I kind of grew up in a household without really any of uh, the stuff. Uh, I remember I had a friend who moved in across the street who was whose family was like very. Um, like Baptist. And, um, he went to this youth group at the church that was on my block. It was like three houses down from me. And I went to their youth group thing a couple of times and I was like telling my mom about it. And she's like, well, that's great. But like, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Like if you, if you want to do that, it's your business. And I decided pretty early on that I like, didn't actually like it that much because it was mostly like weird ex biker guys telling us not to do drugs and stuff, which mm. I got enough of in school. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess like from there on, like I had a, an, an extremely embarrassing and, um, much lamented college atheist phase. Um, I was a member of a campus secular group and, Amazing. uh, that went to some dark places, uh, <laughs> mostly not while I was there, but the guy who started that group later went on to start a men's rights organization. So oh, of course, you kind of get a sense of like, it, this was like, you know, this was in the 2000s before all that stuff, before the new atheism had really started to like, the horrible stuff had started to bubble up and people realized like, oh, this is bad. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I, I feel like, you know, after that, like for a long time, I was like, I don't, I don't need spirituality or religion. And, uh, I, you know, I, um, I got to go around Europe when I was in college because I, um, I studied abroad in England and was able to, to just take a train around, around Europe, um, rather than coming home for the holidays. And in retrospect, I really regret how much of a little shit I was because I was going into the, all of these awe-inspiring places of worship and just being like, 
yeah, I guess. And like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's how, how bad I was. Uh, thankfully I have grown and changed. And, um, I, in the last year, especially, I think qu- quarantine has done this for a lot of people have become a lot more introspective about mm. questions of like religion and spirituality. I think when you're, um, when you're sort of trapped on your own, uh, you get to thinking about those kinds of things more. You, you turn inward, right? Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so my familiarity with, with Christianity specifically, I would say is passing at best. Mm-hmm. Um, I have read some whale uh, or some Simone Vale, which is not really, you know, people have different ideas about her. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I've had stuff secondhand through other people. Um, I, I almost feel like I'm more familiar with Judaism than Christianity. And uh, I, I was considering converting for a while, actually. Um, I've, I've heard that a lot lately. Uh, yeah. Judaism has a, a particular draw at this, at this cultural moment. And I'm not sure what it is. But um, there is something that maybe it's like I think that a lot of people um, view like mainstream Judaism as like very nonjudgmental, right. uh, very non-condemning. Um, there's not um, it, there's not the like cultural baggage of Christianity that comes yeah. along with like, oh, well, Christians must all just be like Trump supporters and mm-hmm. like gun toting like. Republican people, which is like hilariously wrong and couldn't be further from the truth. But that's how people see Christians. <laughs> yeah, today. no, that is it is. Um, but it's um, yeah that something about Judaism is very enticing to people in, yeah. in a particular generation uh, of people right now. I think part of it is um, there is this popular perception that Christianity is an anti-intellectual religion, which um, you know like all religions sometimes is true, but historically, you know, people still have ideas about, oh, in the medieval ages, the church really tamped down on, on science and stuff. And like, that's absolutely not the case. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's like the church was, was, you know, keeping like the works of like Aristotle and these other people alive. Um, and, um, and I think there is this sense that Judaism is sort of like an, a more intellectual kind of religion. Um, but the reason why I didn't do it uh, in the end was that uh, I just I did a lot of research and um, I was like looking into everything I'd have to do. And like that, that was fine. Like, you know, if you if you want to do something like that, you should you should do it. You should do the mikvah. You should do all this stuff. Um, but a, uh, I just sort of I read some stuff from a, a rabbi who basically said, like, if you're a Gentile, you're not bound by the covenant. Um, and basically all you are doing by converting to Judaism is saying, I want to be bound by that covenant. And then if you, you can't get out of it, you know, if you change your mind, like that's not how it works. Um, (laughs) so like if you as a Gentile are just like acting, you know, in, in a virtuous way in Judaism, that's great. Like the covenant is between God and the Jews. And if you're not involved in that, as long as you're acting in, you know, basically I think according to the Ten Commandments or like that sort of, you know, that region, then you're good and you don't have to. And I was like, you know what? That's true. I think I'm just a friend of the Jewish people. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not a Jew myself. I think that, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a universalist, which is like a not extremely common um, belief in Christianity, but like that uh, one does not need to, to be, uh, Christian in practice to be Christian in action and that like being a good person is being a good person. And, um, ultimately it is your, um, how you love and how you treat other people that will uh, see you into, uh, whatever it is, the next realm Mm. is or the next life is. And, um, obviously will affect how you live here on earth too. I mean, um, typically if you walk around being an asshole to everybody, you, will be treated like you're an asshole to everybody and right, people, you'll right. be repellent and people won't want to be around you. So it's as simple as just like, try to be kind and try to be good and generous and, and like loving. And that's interesting that a rabbi would say just like, basically you can convert, but it's, it's, it's a little bit moot. You don't really need to do that. Just be good. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there have been converts 
to Judaism for basically as long as there has been Judaism. Um, but I think for me, yeah, where I came down on it was like, okay, so for some people, this is something that they, they feel like they have to do. I think I just, um, I wasn't just, I wasn't comfortable with, um, the, I don't know there's something about being a convert to that I think is, is really interesting and, and really, um, fraught yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, this idea that, you know, you, you are constant and this, I guess this applies to anything, not just religion, but anyone who, who picks something up or gets into something on a big, on a big level is, you know, you, you have to sort of be overzealous to, to kind of sell your commitment. And, um, especially in Judaism where, you know, a lot of people are, are Jewish, um, but don't practice. There's this kind of dynamic, um, between converts who are like, no, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm keeping the Sabbath. I'm doing all this stuff. Uh, because like, if you're not going to do that stuff, why convert? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's almost like, well, if you're born into it, you're born into it. And like, it doesn't matter. But like, if you're not going to go the whole nine yards, I mean, whatever, I'm sure some people, you know, are flexible on that and I'm not judging them. But to me, it was just like, it, it didn't make sense. Um, but yeah, is universalism... Okay, so I always get this confused um, because I know some people who are Unitarians and I know sometimes you'll see Unitarian Universalist. Was there like a merger between those two, but there are still like... Yeah, uh, I, I don't know the, the exact history of the UU church, um, but I know that um, like Unitarians are um, like basically the, the the kinds of Christians or the the, the kinds of believers that believe that um, like we can practice our faith in any way. Mm. So Unitarian Universalists specifically will be um, will be the folks that will like not just have uh, Christian prayer uh, s- uh, sessions or or um, like groups, but they'll also have like Buddhist meditation groups and they'll, right, they, they'll, right. they'll practice yoga and they'll be you know so they'll be doing all kinds of different like mindful activities and spiritual activities. Um, it's kind of like this. It's a really interesting uh, practice. I I don't know. There's something it, as like loosey goosey as I am at times with with faith. Like there's something very comforting to like to me about ritual and like orthodoxy. That yeah. like, obviously I don't follow that being who I am and like doing what I do and living how I live. But um, I like a little bit of structure. And the Unitarian Universalists and God bless them that they, they really just. They throw it out there. <laughs> you yeah. Know, they really do. It's, that to um, me is because I, so I know, um, like I said, I know some people who are, are very much into, uh, into who, who are Unitarians or, you know, universal Unitarians. Um, and, um, it seems really cool. And to me, it seems like, but to me from, you know, if I'm talking about getting involved in that, I'm like, okay, well, what, what is here that is like what is drawing me to this? Like, why would I go to this and not just go to some other thing that is like also communal and also <laughs> about, the, and it, I'm sure there are good reasons, but also, you know, it's, um, the, they're doing a whole heresy with the Unitarian thing, right? Because they don't <laughs> believe in the Trinity. So um, yeah, heresy is a, heresy is a tricky word because that's true. Yeah. Uh, that, that whole concept has been so, uh, flipped upside down and misused throughout time. Mm, it's like, mm-hmm. how many youth pastors do you see with tattoos all over their bodies yeah. now when uh, Leviticus strictly forbids it? How many How many different cases do you see? Um, many such even, cases. Yeah, I mean, y- you know, the, it, you could have... Um, <laughs> I, I need, I'm trying to, to word my, my response carefully because I really don't want to upset anybody. But it is like almost... Like um, the the core message of like Christianity is what's important to like Christians in general, or should be important to Christians in general, and the people that get hung up on the minutia of like the rule book aspect mm. of the Bible are, the Bible are always rules missing lawyers. Important. I mean, yeah. really, they are. It's 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 um, you can't possibly live biblically. It's not in in our society. You cannot right. do it. And like, yeah, luck, I mean, but, you, you, maybe you could have in the context in which this was written, but like, there are just so many things that are just completely alien about society and culture <laughs> that it would just, 
yeah, you can do a lot of it, but like, there's always gonna be like, oh, polyester or like, oh, glasses or oh, like shellfish. Um, (laughs) And so there are these things that I feel like, you know, people pick and, and kind of choose from them, but um, but Christians aren't are Christians bound by uh, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant? So this is where uh, things get kind of interesting because I think there are a lot of people that read the words of when Jesus said, um, "I'm not here to um, to change the law or erase the law. I'm here to fulfill the law." Mm. Um, that uh, I'm not here to disrupt your practice. I'm here to say, like, great job. Let's move on to the next and uh, and and create like a world covenant and right. open up the faith to all all people and because I'm I'm about to do something really big right I'm gonna die I'm gonna forgive everybody's yeah. sins I'm gonna I'm gonna um, raise from the dead et cetera et cetera but then there are a lot of people that say well Jesus was the end of the law when he said I'm here to fulfill the law it means that like I'm here doing this now so that you guys can kind of put aside all of those rules and there there are cases where Jesus says something like. Uh, you know, what you put in your mouth doesn't make you unclean. So like it's mm-hmm. what comes out of your mouth that makes you unclean. So that is kind of implying that like all those food rules can kind of be tossed out. But there's nowhere explicitly where the Bible in the New Testament says that like you can just ignore the Old Testament. That's that's it's hogwash now. We, we're okay. focusing on the new stuff. No, there's yeah. nowhere that actually says that. Huh. But um I want to go. I want to go back to something you said about the, the, um, the secularist club head yeah. uh, winding up going to be a men's rights activist because I think it kind of plays into <sighs> what we're going to talk about today. Um, isn't it fascinating that so often the thing that's hurled at um, Orthodox Jews and and Christians alike is like this um, this notion that women are subjugated or women are like put upon by these faiths and they're not able to be free and they're not able to, um, they're, they're not admired in the way. This whole, the Song of Solomon, this whole <laughs> book is about how beautiful a woman is. <laughs> like, it's just admiring the absolute beauty and and like acknowledging the like how, how what a blessing like love is in our lives. Um, it's so funny to me. It's like people that, that see Christianity or see, you know, Orthodox Judaism, I should say, because Reform Judaism is a little bit different in that regard, but um, see Christianity in uh, in a way that's like um, inherently misogynist or something. Right, it's right. It's so wrong. That's so well, wrong because yeah. look, at how, look at this beautiful, this is, bizarre <laughs> chapter of this book. It's, it's wild, right? I, I, when I was, I had no idea what to expect. And you said, you know, read Song of Solomon 7. And yeah, I started and it's how beautiful are your feet and sandals? And like, what? That's in the Bible? And uh, <laughs> it, it reminded me of something that, and again, like I, I've gotten most of my Bible studies education from um, second parties. So like this may not be textually correct, but um, Alan Watts talks about how, you know, evil is uh, a spiritual thing uh, in Christianity, but people treat it as a bodily thing. People treat the body as evil. Like mm. there is this this trend in Christian thinking towards, well, the body is impure and, uh, you know, it, it leads you to sin, whether that's by eating too much or um, being lustful or all of these other things. Um, and so, you know, the, the spirit is sort of the pure thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if that's... that's uh, the case, I think there's a lot to be, there's a case to be made that Christianity is like an extremely material religion, um, Judaism as well. And this idea that like, oh, the body is is sinful is almost always weaponized against women, right? Like mm. women are ones who incite lust, right? And yet, we, and like we have this, this passage here that's just this guy going off about like <laughs> how beautiful uh, this woman is. And, and then she's like, yeah, you're pretty great too. We should make love. <laughs> let's go out to the fields. Uh, let's, let's go to the fields and lodge <laughs> in the villages. Um, yeah, here's my fruit, go into the garden. And, uh, what's really interesting to me about this is like, I was reading about it and, and just, um, so I guess the, the song, uh, song of Solomon is, um, 
it's in the uh is it the ketuvim ketuvim i uh, uh, that yeah I, my expertise isn't okay. quite there <laughs> it's, yet it's I in know the last part of the, the tanakh yeah it has this uh, the same book as the psalms and the proverbs basically is what you're getting at right yeah yeah, yeah. so it's not um it's not about like uh oh here's the covenant between um the Jewish people and God. It's not about like, here's like what wisdom is. Here's like how you should live. It's just like, Hey, sexual love is pretty cool. (laughs) And so like, as a result, you have people being like, well, this can't possibly be taken up. Like this can't possibly mean what it says it means. It has to be about the covenant between God and Israel Mm -hmm. um, or between, you know, uh, Christ and the church yeah. uh, and the church is Christ's bride in this metaphor. And it's like, that is some truly galaxy brain stuff. Like, I guess <laughs> like, yeah, fine. Allegory and stuff. But like, it's, it's, I don't, it's like, why can't you just take it as like, wow, it's, it's so cool that God gave us these righteous bods. And <laughs> it's such deeply physical them. language, right? Yeah. It's so intensely physical that even if this were a metaphor, the metaphor is so, so complicated and so intense that we it would be inscrutable. There's no way we would ever be able to pick this apart and know what the language is supposed to be meaning. If this is a conversation right. of God, you know, this is a, a reference of God's love for the church. I truly don't believe that. I think that this is an example of like the blessing of love in our lives and like the blessing of, of physicality in our lives that, that says like outright, it's not bad to like have sex. It's not like bad to, to be a human being and express yourself in that way. Of course there are bad ways to do that, which right. different parts of the Bible say in different ways, but like, this is just delighting in the body of someone yeah. that you love, which is, I mean, what a good message that is. It's it's great. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled <laughs> with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never heard someone compare breasts. I've heard people compare breasts to a lot of things, never to two fawns. What do you think that particular metaphor means or simile means? Because I can't... I read that over and over and over again because I, okay, first of all, the book is obsessed with breasts, especially seven, chapter seven, seven, chapter eight. There's a lot of breast talk. But what does it mean that breasts are like fawns or like gazelles? Like what does a deer have to do with with boobs? I, all I can think of is like, if like a a deer was like curled up, like if baby deer was like curled up uh, (laughs) and it was like really soft and like kind of like a little bit of a mound, I guess that's like, or or just like, you know, um, new and like bursting with life or something. I I don't, twins of a gazelle. Yeah, I don't and know, that's, that's in the standard. And the, the King James, it's thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. <laughs> the... The only other thing that came to mind for me, other than like the physical shape of them, which is odd because like I was picturing the head and it's like her boobs must be really pointy or something. <laughs> but I thought that maybe the way that deer run is very like bouncy. And like oh. maybe that's what it's like in a reference to the motion or something. But there's no maybe. other notion of like movement in this. So I'm, I'm not really sure if that's accurate. Or yeah, not. I don't know. But then the next line is really interesting because... Uh, it's your neck is like an ivory tower. And I think that is the first usage of the phrase ivory tower. (laughs) Which uh, means something very different. Which means something very different now. It's like so weird to read that and be like, what? My neck is like uh, a bunch of academics who (laughs) who don't care about the real world. No, it's just like, it's, it's an ivory tower, which became, um, I think it became an epithet for Mary uh, at some point. Yeah. That's said in the, yeah, in the non-rude sense, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of locations and stuff too, right? So like your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose wow. is like a tower of Lebanon. How would you feel if someone referred to your nose as like a tower? 
a tower like a, of like Lebanon, a mountain in another which looks in another toward Damascus. I would feel a little bit. I feel bit. like it's one of those things where like someone is trying to give you a compliment, but it's like about something you're really insecure about. And so you, you're like, okay, well, clearly you're into really big noses or something, but that makes me feel like you're saying my nose is big. Um, it was it's like, I don't know. Um, the um, the description, your head crowns you like caramel is not a reference to um, the, the the candy snack. Oh, that we all really? Know and love. No, it's, oh, yeah, it's, if it's, a, it's a reference to a place. <laughs> but the next line, and your flowing locks are like purple. Like purple. I get hung up on that every time. What does it mean to be like purple? What does that mean? Is it like, like, um, I mean, purple is like the, the color. I mean, I'm not sure if it was at this time, but purple is associated with royalty. And the next line is uh, a king is held captive in the tresses. That has to be it then. Because, yeah, I, I just looked at my, the voice is my favorite, like, modern English translation. They do some very theatrical language. It's very over the top. I love mm. it. Uh, and it says, your head is as stately as Mount Carmel. Your hair shines like a tapestry of royal purple cloth. The king is oh, held okay. captive by your locks. So, yeah, like the purple is like a shorthand for saying uh, the, right. the sort of purple you would see in, a, in like a, a royal court or something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What, it, what would it mean then that a king is held, held captive in the tresses? The, um, you are a... You're a tower with beautiful tapestry hair, and there's a king inside of you, like inside of your brain or inside I, of your body. It, or a king is held captive in the tresses. Like, it, is it like your face, like framed by your hair, or like you have a king? You have a king face. You have a king face. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yet again, uh, feels like a backhanded compliment. Let's, yeah. Hey, you have a really, you're a really handsome woman. Um, <laughs> let me see. Okay, so in King James, it says, "Thine head upon these like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple." The king is held in the galleries. That's oh. even more confusing. Galleries, I would think, would be like more like the eyes, but we already touched on the eyes. The eyes are are fish pools they are they are <laughs> what no maybe we move on to verse six because i feel like yeah i feel like we're we're getting lost in this one it says we're getting how, lost in the trusses <laughs> how beautiful and pleasant you are that's nice oh loved one with all of your delights your stature is like a palm tree and your breasts are like its clusters um we're back to breasts again we're back like he was going up he's like looking down he's like going back up he's like going up and then he's just like mm, let me just go back down for a second i don't think i adequately covered this situation here <laughs> i think we need to talk about the breasts again uh, it all makes me seem like it all makes me think that like solomon or whoever it was that actually wrote this because there's a lot of right. things that are attributed to different people in the bible that didn't actually yeah. write it, but whoever wrote this was a short guy <laughs> A short king, a literal short king. <laughs> a short king with hundreds of wives and concubines. Uh, and, and Yeah, maybe, no, maybe that's at his eye level. Maybe that's why he's <laughs> that's thinking he's about so that. fixated on. Is, that's why he, because it's like, oh, my eyes are up here. And it's like, yeah, well, he has to look way back to see them. He says, I will, I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. This is like <sighs> a little guy climbing a big, tall woman. Yeah, <laughs> this is some, wow, this is sort of paving the way for so many Twitter guys. <laughs> this is, yeah, the, setting the groundwork. Short Kings, w we hear you. We know you're out there. You know, just keep doing your thing. And and write some beautiful poetry about, about tall women because it's, it's very important. <laughs> I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine. Like grapes, I think is what they're referring to there. They are, yeah. And the scent of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. So your mouth and breath smell differently. Your breath smells like apples, but your mouth <laughs> is like wine. Uh, maybe like it's intoxicating. Oh, it's, possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in KJV, it says, uh, 
smell of thy nose like apples, and the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved, that goeth down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. Whoa. Yeah, that's pretty different. So, yeah, in the ESV, it hits. So it's it separates here. Oh, yeah, it does. In the yeah. ESV. It's saying that actually the next line is is the, the woman that's is being she, talked about. She, she yeah. It's she. She doesn't have a name right now, but she. It, it goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding over lips and teeth. My mouth goes down smoothly for my beloved. That is very vulgar. I mean, that is... So I, I listen to... A, I usually listen to some sermons before episodes to, to try to get a sense of like how... How does the general Christian people... How do the general Christian people feel about this particular chapter? And I found very few sermons about this. Wow, about this chapter. The <laughs> I ones that why. I, the ones that I did were like this language often makes us blush. <laughs> this language, <laughs> we usually skip over these particular sections of the Bible. And it's like you can't mm-hmm. skip what over. Do you mean skip just because it, it makes you uncomfortable. Like it's it's in there. It's in there. Um, I think that like there is something innate in our humanity that makes most, I'll say most of us, because obviously some people are just, they just thrive on it. But there is something that kind of inherently makes us kind of bashful about sex. And I don't know if it's just like insecurity about our bodies or um, some notion that we learned when we were young, that there's something shameful about our bodies or something. But like the Bible, I feel like is being very clear here that it's like, if you're in a loving relationship with somebody, you can go to town. You really can. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, I mean, that's unless you're going for like the, this is all a big metaphor about how Christ loves the church. Um, in which case you still have to admit that whoever wrote this was mad horny. <laughs> like, and, and thought that that was a good idea to like, write. Like, here's the thing. Like, even if this is a metaphor, like it's approvingly writing of of this stuff. Like, it's not saying like, oh, you're making me so horny, you bitch. Like, it's like, this is cool. So like, even if this was a metaphor, it's like implicitly saying that this stuff is all great. That it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And and if, if this is the metaphor, if we're to believe that this is a metaphorical thing, then what on earth uh, are the breasts? Why are we focusing so much great on the breasts? Question. Great and what, question. And what part of the church goes down smoothly on on God. I, ju- I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how anyone could see this as a metaphor. I'm picturing like a, a giant church transforming into like, like doing, being a transformer, um, oh turning into just like a giant robot lady. Um, that's probably not what they had in mind, but who's to say? I, um, I'll admit I'm blushing right now. Well, I, I think this is... Um, this is probably my most heretical episode yet, but it, it's... Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's it's wonderful because this okay. is the sort of stuff we have to... I've been avoiding this book for a number of reasons, but primarily it's because I just don't feel like... Until now, I didn't really feel like I had the... Like, I didn't really have a perspective enough on the entire Bible to understand, like, why something like this right. would be necessary in the Bible. But I think that if we consider every other piece of the Bible as, um, yes, you have your your Torah, you have your rules, you have, um, you know, your songs, you have your prophets, you have your gospels, you have the, the epistles, and then you have the, the revelation, it all kind of fits together in this way that, like, this is an essential song. This is an essential part of being human. Um, right. Spirituality is, yes, the focus on the otherworldly, the, the, the focus on things that are not uh, of the physical world. But God being all and in all and around all cannot be avoided in, in our daily physical lives. And so there has to be some kind of like acknowledgement of the fact that like it's it's cool at times to feel good about your body. It's it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like again, I'm I'm talking totally 
out of my ass here because I am not an expert in this stuff, nor am I like a practicing anything really. But, um, you know, people have sort of similar ideas, I think sometimes about Buddhism being very much about, um, because, you know, what is Buddhism about? Okay, desire or striving causes suffering. Um, and so people think, okay, so that just means I, I should not desire anything. And if I, um, you know, Buddhism says you shouldn't become intoxicated. It says you shouldn't do all these things. So that means I shouldn't drink. I shouldn't have sex, um, all this stuff. But like, actually, like it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> and a lot of people argue, well, no, like the, the reason these exist these, these rules exist is because these are the kinds of things, you know, people think of like the term attachment in Buddhism, right. Mm -hmm. And are like, oh, you shouldn't be attached to things. Um, but well, what does that mean? Like, does that mean you shouldn't, um, you know, you shouldn't like eating dinner or you shouldn't like, <laughs> like spending time with, with someone that you're in love with or being sexual with them? Like, no, probably not. It, you know, it, it means, these are things that can consume your life if you allow them to. Um, and like, there's a big difference between, between what is, is happening here and, and someone who is just like, my whole life is about lust. That's it, baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and like, whatever, some people might respond to that saying like, well, what's the big deal with that? Like, it's not hurting anyone. And like, maybe that's true. But I just think within the context of, of these um, systems of like of belief and thought like I, that to me is a much more interesting and, and productive way to look at it than um, and like more textual based on this right of like no this is great stuff like it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that matters or that you should prioritize this above all else but like it's a part of life yeah exactly there's a um... There's a word that's very uh, popular in um, like progressive Christian or um, what they call deconstructionist Christian discourse, and that is discernment. And mm. discernment is this notion of, of understanding that life is very complex and that perhaps um, this book that we have from thousands of years ago may not be um, entirely literal and may not be entirely sufficient in helping us sort out how we might best live in a, in a way that, that pleases God or in a way that pleases, um, or in a way that is like Christ. And, right. and sometimes you have to kind of, um, toy with the notion that, um, there are going to be things that the Bible can't teach us. Uh, and again, here's my, that's my heresy of the day right there. <laughs> I do do one every episode. I, I love this book with all of my heart. I feel very convicted whenever I read the Bible and, and I feel very, you know, strongly about, you know, my, my relationship with Jesus. But like there, <laughs> this is as close as the Bible gets to explaining to us how to, how to be physical creatures in the world. And we can't avoid that with the alternative is just killing ourselves. And that, and that's not an alternative at all. So we have to, um, we have to kind of um, learn how to tease out the the little the little bits of um, pieces of, of scripture that um, might inform us in the right direction in a world that is absolutely nothing like the one that this uh, book took place in. That the very first line of this chapter um, having to deal with uh, having to do with um, this woman's feet in sandals. I was just listening to a podcast earlier today about a biblical archaeology or, or ancient you know, Jewish archaeology, really, at the time. And, um, and this is a, an expert talking about what the world was like at the time that the Bible was written. And she said it was stinky. It, everyone, <laughs> everyone, that makes sense. Yeah. everyone smelled terrible. This is an environment that was dry. There wasn't a lot of water. Um, there wasn't um, modern toilets or showers, um, and people would take their body waste and they would throw it into the street when they were when they were done. 
And so this, we're talking here, the very first line of this chapter is about how beautiful someone's feet are. When this, this woman's feet have probably been walking around in, in excrement for, you know, for the well, entire day. Maybe he's into that. But no, but yeah, that is, <laughs> that, that's true, right? It is like, and you know, probably if, if you were to somehow go back in time, the stench would be overwhelming. It would be unbearable. But if you are, if that is what you know, it's normal, right? Um, so that's why the Bible isn't full of, wow, everyone really smells. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, it, it would if you if you uh, went back there. And I think that's really interesting to, I can see how this would be a big point of tension because I think in any case, in any like system, in any like religion or belief structure, when you start moving away from foundational texts, people get antsy because then it's like, well, you know, if we can move a little bit away, then why not more? Um, if, is this really infallible? Is this really like, you know, it sort of opens you up to more doubts. And I think that that can really scare people. And I, I understand that. And at the same time, like, it, yeah, trying to imagine a, a, a Jesus figure today or like Jesus today, again, somehow if he were like brought into our time, like wouldn't be talking the same way, wouldn't as in the Bible, wouldn't be like, act, you know, would express the same sentiments, I would imagine, mm-hmm. but probably in, in much different ways. And probably there are a lot of things that, um, that would be different about that. The only, um, the only depictions of a Jesus in modern times that I've seen are either like horrifically cringy, like from, from mm-hmm. Christian films of, uh, you know, like the encounter where, um, Jesus is like a diner owner or whatever. Um, or, uh, it's like musical theater. Uh, my, one of my favorite musicals wow. is Godspell and the okay, original, yeah. <laughs> the original film has Victor Garber playing Jesus. Excuse me, the wool council guy? <laughs> it's amazing. Wow. It is very wool. That's my official uh, sponsorship of if I've ever recommended. I don't. I don't talk a lot about film on the on the show because I have friends who are experts in this sort of thing. But the film, uh, uh, the film version of the musical Godspell is absolutely incredible and and is like required watching. Even if, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're just kind of like interested in what Victor Garber might look like as Jesus, he does I, a phenomenal job. And how could you not be, <laughs> really? Um, so then it, it goes into, um, yeah, it's like, so she is saying it goes down smoothly, blah, blah, blah. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. And then it's got this other heading. And I think I read that, like, it's not really clear. Like, there are debates around, like, how this is structured and, like, how it's broken up. Yeah. Um, And people don't really know exactly what it works or how it works. But uh, in the English standard, uh, the next heading is the bride gives her love. And um, I guess this is... I'm, I don't know if this is her again. I think this maybe is back to the guy. Um, I, I'm not sure because if you look to, and I don't know if you read chapter eight, but chapter eight is really special. We're not even going to go there because there are some very, very weird lines in that too. But the, the chapter eight is headlined longing for her beloved. So it could be switching, but it almost feels like to me, this might be coming from the perspective and it starts, of the woman. Oh, that you were like a brother to me. So, Wow. Um, the Bible is canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Promoting incest. Um, not the first time either, I would say that. But um, yeah, okay, so she says, Come, my beloved, let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Seems like a pretty good place to lodge. Mm-hmm. Um, or among the Hannah plants is another translation for that, I think. Or Seven, that's in seven. Oh, I saw that right. footnote. That's very interesting. Or among yeah. the henna plants. Among the henna plants. Let us go early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. Wow. Okay. So this is all just very like, I mean, this is something that's still around today, right? It's like mm-hmm. um, sex metaphors, but that's a motorcycle. Um Sex metaphors around like plants, and in a way, it's like not even really a metaphor, right? Because like flowers are 
the sex organs of plants. <laughs> like it's just an analogy <laughs> at that yeah, point. It's an analogy. Yeah. It's uh, like yeah. It's a correlation like, oh, in, yeah. in bloom. It's like, mm. okay. Yeah. You're, um, there I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance and beside our doors are all choice fruits. The choices fruits new as well. <laughs> not I, that's, I added that. <laughs> new as well as old which i have laid up for you oh my beloved oh, i've got beloved. all these fruits for you and i now this part um i don't want to get too too far off track but um there was this guy who was i guess trying to entice me or something and he kept leaving me fruit like outside my door um <laughs> this is like not a joke or made up it's it's he, he was like he would leave like boxes of plums and like blackberries and stuff and i would see him on the street and he'd be like do you want a mango and i'm like is this your one move is offering fruit <laughs> um but here it's it, she says no I've, I've got all the choice fruits new as well as old which i have laid up for you so it sounds nice there but i'm know. the one giving you the fruit well, right, which makes yeah. sense given like all the references to the breasts being like clusters. Yes. Yeah. And um and so she's she's offering all of her fruit to to Solomon or or the writer of the the Song of Songs. Um I mean it's a really beautiful way to like close out the chapter and and makes kind of the next section a, a little bizarre. And I think eight is always kind of understood to be like, um, well, we're trying to wrap this up here because we gotta, <laughs> we gotta get to Isaiah and Isaiah is very do, yeah. important. Yeah. Um, so there, there's eight, eight in particular. And again, I don't want to talk too much about it because that's off wow, base, yeah, but really eight jumps from eight. place to place to place. It is, um, it's, it's very difficult. We to have follow. a little sister and she has no breasts. <laughs> I was hoping anyway, you wouldn't read that. That's not, yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm scourging it, scourging it. It's gone. Um, but yeah, like this, um, I guess there was like debate over whether this should even be included in, in like canon for I a while. I can't imagine why they would, I can't, why no, there yeah. would be a debate about this. Um, but, but yeah, like so, it's called it's called the Song of Solomon. Um, it's also called the Song of Songs, which is like a, a common like construction mm-hmm. in in Hebrew um, around that time, calling something like the X of X, the holiest, like of the holy of holies. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm, yeah. So, um, uh, Rabbi Akiva said the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Like it's if if you shouldn't question if it's you know defiling or whatever. It's uh, this was given to us as part of this whole package. So like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's cool. It's great. Um, and I guess like more recently, like a lot of feminist scholars have really like looked at it and been like, wow, this is pretty wild. Um, <laughs> Toni Morrison wrote a novel called Song of Solomon in the seventies. Like there's a lot of references to this. It's funny. Cause like there, are, I was reading through Wikipedia and it's like, wow, there's like a lot of people have made a lot of art and, and work based on this. And I had never heard of it until today. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the importance of Solomon being credited for a large number of the Proverbs, which are supposed to be like wisdom literature. Like these are ways right. that we best live our lives. And then the next, the next movement in the Bible goes straight to this intensely um, passionate and sensual and almost, I shouldn't even say almost erotic, erotic writing um, coming from someone who just informed you how to live your best life. That <laughs> the importance of that should not be lost on us. I yeah. think that it is important to kind of go, okay, well, if we were listening to him in Proverbs, maybe we should be listening to him in this too. But again, we don't know that a lot of the Proverbs that were credited Solomon weren't really written by Solomon. And, and, and perhaps based on the language that they're saying, it couldn't, uh, this this language uh, translation couldn't have been uh, written exactly when Solomon was around too, but I mean all that's kind of up in the air. We don't we don't know. There's so much about this book we don't know. It's I mean it's kind of cool because it lets us chuckle about it and go oh well we're not really sure what happened here. Right. But isn't it entertaining to read? So going back to the idea that it's a metaphor, um, which again like from my very uneducated perspective, it doesn't seem to be the case, but like, if it is, this is a really 
even going beyond like the eroticism stuff, it's a really weird metaphor to use for a relationship between God and the church or like Christ and the church or God and humanity, because it's, the song isn't like, Hey, um, like you're my wife, you belong to me and I get to do whatever I want to you. And it's like, you know, partially written from this, this woman's perspective. And she's just like, yeah, let's go nuts. Um, <laughs> like she's also like, like super into it. And it's like, these people are, are being presented as, you know, as like lovers, as, as kind of like equals. So if that's a metaphor, that's really weird, right? To be like, oh yeah, no, God and, and humanity are, are partners, are like equals. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, if the church is the bride of Christ too, then why Christ is so, is so admiring of the church yeah. Where if you, if you look in Revelation and you look in um, the epistles, which are, you know, spoken through Paul and spoken through Timothy, why why is Christ admiring the church? And why does Christ think the church is so beautiful if in the epistles and in Revelation, Christ has a lot to say about what the church is doing wrong yeah. at that particular time? I don't know. I, it, it really doesn't pencil to me. that Driving people notion, out of the temples and stuff that doesn't yeah. really square with this. That that notion of this being a metaphor, I'm sorry, it just, it makes <laughs> no sense to me at all. And and if it, if it were, then there are layers of this metaphor that I truly cannot understand. And I don't think I ever will. I would love to hear like a a really compelling argument for it. And I might have to look one up in later just because, and not one that's coming from a defensive place of, ah, I don't really want to talk about this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't really want to do a, do a sermon on this. I would love to hear a theologian like talk about like, okay, no, here is how, here is why this is about this. Um, because I bet it would be really interesting. If you find one, will you I please will, share it with me? I will let you know. Okay. I really need to hear it. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on in this? Because I, uh, I don't think we really got as far into it as as maybe we could have. But there's so much to work with here. There is so much language to be toyed with, and, and obviously, as we as we look through the different translations, we saw that different translators saw this in very different ways and used very different language, and that completely changes the metaphor. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Um... It's, <laughs> it's wild. Again, like, I was really surprised by this um, because, you know, I mean, you always, you hear like, you know, South Park jokes and stuff about like, what? That's in the Bible that if you, you have to, you can beat your slave and then sell an ass or something. And like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we, we all know about stuff like, I mean, we don't really know, but we, we think we know about stuff like that. But then mm -hmm. like, like, I literally have never heard anyone mention this. And I, to be fair, don't know a lot of practicing Christians. Uh, don't spend a lot of time reading Christian theology. But um, I am now really curious about how this this figures into everything. And uh, I feel like I'm going to have to like find a book or something. I've just like, um, yeah, I think there was, I don't know if it's a book or an article, but apparently someone named Phyllis Tribal wrote Depatriar Depatriarchalizing, which... That's should a not word. be a word. It's, yeah. <laughs> is it? I don't know. Uh, I'm not in sure. biblical interpretation, uh, and uh, and talked about this quite a lot. So, wow, that yeah. sounds like a, yeah. I would actually like to read some theory on this because on its on its face, it's it's titillating. Um, but I think obviously there's more here to like like with any book of the Bible, there's more here to work with. And and um, golly, I hope that this um, helps. <laughs> the, the reading more of this type of literature uh, can help me kind of cast um, cast the right view on particular parts of the Bible that I struggle with a lot. And and I, I I'll admit, like literature, like literary analysis books are not super compelling to me. But sure. when it's about a book that I'm like so passionate about otherwise, like maybe I'll be able to actually get into it. Maybe I can actually dig into that. Yeah. Um, I want to shout out, uh, there's a painter, um, Eon Search, Search, T-S-C-H-I, 
RCH. And uh, he was a German uh, 20th century painter who did this uh, set of paintings about, um, about the Song of Songs. And they were lost for a long time, and they only rediscovered them a few years ago. And they're these incredibly striking, like, really high contrast, like, light and dark um, depictions of, of each of the uh, the books or the poems. And, uh, yeah, I, you should um, look them up because it's, uh, it's pretty cool. That sounds beautiful. Um, is there anything you want to shout? I, I usually read a poem at the end of every episode. Oh, cool. Um, do you want to do any um, plugs or any shout outs otherwise before um, we close out here? I mean, yeah, check out if you know, if you like podcasts and if you're listening to this, I assume you do, uh, check out the Fanbyte podcast. Just go to fanbyte.com slash podcasts. And, uh, we do a whole mess of them. There's, you know, stuff about movies, there's stuff about, um, there's a podcast about MMA. Uh, there's, there's one about, um, role-playing games. There's a whole bunch. You'll find one that you like probably. So, and, uh, we, you know, I think everyone there does really great work. So check that out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for, for coming on. I mean, this yeah, was. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. This was a, a really unique and, uh, and really cool podcast guesting experience. <laughs> thank you. And what a fun, what a fun conversation. I mean, um, I knew that the material was unconventional, but um, I think we made the most of it. <laughs> I think so. Well, the poem today is, I thought, um, given the subject matter that we were dealing with, uh, I thought it might be appropriate to read a section from I Sing the Body Electric by Walt Whitman. Oh, wow. Uh, It is from section two, the love of the body of man or woman box account, the body itself box account. That of the male is perfect and that of the female is perfect, the expression of the face box account. But the expression of a well-made man appears not only in his face, it is in his limbs and joints also. It is curiously in the joints of his hips and wrists. It is in his walk, the carriage of his neck, the flex of his waist and knees. Dress does not hide him. The strong, sweet quality he has strikes through the cotton and broadcloth. To see him pass conveys as much as the best poem, perhaps more. You linger to see his back and the back of his neck and shoulder side. Thanks, everybody. Love is simple.